pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, roll call, please. You got it. Uh, Shepard. Here. Likens. Here. Porfilio. Here. Oxley. Here. Maloney. Here. Pin is absent. And Wheeler. Here. We have a quorum. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes from the May 12th meeting? So move. Moved by Porfinio. Second. Second. Second by Shepard. Any questions, comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Tonight we have a couple public hearings. There are variances. We're sort of wearing a different hat here. Um, before we get started, I have a question for, for Sonny, for our attorney, so everyone understands this. Sonny, if <clears throat> Kimberly and I had this discussion about if we approve this, is there any liability on the city's part if there's ever an issue with anything like, of this nature? Well, obviously anyone can file a lawsuit. Um, it depends on you know, the nature of the case and whether or not they have a viable claim. Um, Any time that a variance is granted, especially when it has to do with health, safety, and the purpose of uh, protecting others from the risk of liability, it's always better uh, for the zoning code, and the zoning code is to protect the welfare of the public. Mm -hmm. So that is the, you know, one of the primary objectives of the zoning code. Now, um, it, it, it does increase the risk um, if there was any um, variance that was granted and that was foreseeable that that such variance would cause harm to somebody in the future, yes, that could subject the city to liability. I think the more concerning factor is that, again, it, we're here to protect, you know, the zoning codes is supposed to protect the public welfare. Um, the other danger is setting a precedent in which somebody else down the line uh, wants the same thing and you end up having various uh, properties that have variances that are granted based upon one case um, in mind, and that, in, again, increases the liability of the city. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. The first case is, um, let me see which one we got here, PH1. Lance? Yeah, if we could have a motion to open up the public hearing before we start. A motion to open the public hearing. So move. By Perfino, second by Likens. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Ayes have it. And before the case is present, if I could ask the chairman to swear in anyone who uh, will be presenting any facts or testimony or statements um, that's related to this case. Okay. Uh, Lance, and is the applicant here? Yeah, right here. Okay. Um, please come forward to the podium. Uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, Ed Riley, 707 South Jefferson Street. Thank you. Sandy Riley, 707 South Jefferson Street. Okay. Do um, you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Ed, yes. Sandy, Lance? Yes. I do. Thank you very much. Okay. Lance? All righty. Thank you, Chairman and Plan Commissioners. Um, this is a case uh, at 707 South Jefferson. Um, it is at the southwest corner of 7th Street in Jefferson, uh, directly over to our northeast. Um, it's a corner lot zoned RO Heritage Residential. Uh, the applicant, Mr. Riley, is requesting two variances from the zoning ordinance. Uh, number one is from section 156033 under the general and bulk regulations for accessory structures and permitted obstructions specific to swimming pools. Um, that ordinance states that swimming pools and any decks attached thereto shall be located a minimum of six feet from, the fen from any fence or property line. Um, the applicant is requesting that he be allowed to keep his pool deck and connected stairs on the property line at a zero foot setback. In addition, uh, he's, he is seeking a second variance for a reduced setback for his upper deck from five feet to three feet. Um, this is from section 156031 under the table of permitted obstructions, which states that a deck unroofed and not more than four feet above the average level of the adjoining ground 
provided it is no closer than five feet from the property lines is permitted in the interior side yard. He is looking to reduce that to three feet rather than the five feet. On your screen is the plan of survey. <clears throat> you can see on the um, drawing that is there, he shows um, in red where the deck is currently located. Um, the survey uh, was done right after the deck was finished, um, which showed it on the neighbor's property line. It has since been adjusted to be on the property line uh, through some reconstruction that Mr. Riley did um, recently. Just for some background on this particular project, uh, the applicant's request is slightly challenged by the fact that it was already uh, constructed um, and it had been done so without permits or building and zoning department reviews. Um, we recognize that a deck was under construction back in March, um, but we couldn't see the extent of the work because of the fence along 7th Street. Our building inspector, Brian Polis, who's with us in the audience today, if you have any questions for him, uh, placed a violation notice on the house on March 25th um, that required that the homeowner come into the building department to review the project with us and secure the appropriate permits. Uh, we met with the applicant on April 7th at the house to review the project and found that the swimming pool that was installed in 2019 uh, is now being wrapped by a deck that swings around to the south side of the, of the swimming pool. Um, we noted the setback issues um, and asked the applicant to come in to request permits and fill out the paperwork. Um, we asked them to put up some temporary safety precautions in the meantime so that there weren't any issues with somebody. Um, in the time after that, he did complete the deck and finished it with handrails and spindles and all the other uh, finishings uh, for a deck, including the patio set and the planted uh, pots and everything else on the site. Um, we requested that they pl provide plans and a permit application so that we could uh, evaluate the project. Um, and then when he started to continue to do the work in order to uh, asked that he stop the work. We had to place a stop work order on the house um, so that we could um, have it be stopped until we could resolve this issue. We did receive the plat of survey that you see on the screen um, on June 3rd, which showed the applicant had built the deck onto the neighboring property um, that has since been removed. The pictures on the screen show you the current state of the deck. Um, the pool obviously is on the right-hand side of that shot the deck and the setback in question specifically is where you see the new fence on the right side of the image. Um, the neighbor's deck is kind of underneath the stairs there in the background with the uh, vertical spindles on it and then also the um, lattice work on the left is also the underside of the neighbor's deck um, as well. Some other pictures, the one on the left shows the space between the neighbor's deck um, to the south and the Riley's deck um, to the north. Uh, there's a close-up. The one that's on the, on the far left side is taken from the upper level area. The one that is in the middle is taken from the lower deck um, section. And then the one on the far right is taken from the um, stairs that lead up to the lower deck. Um, and the key point here from the swimming deck grant in particular is the accessibility from the neighbor's adjoining deck onto this deck, which again goes to the point of why we have this six foot setback requirement for a pool and the attached deck is what we are trying to limit is people who can um, simply climb onto somebody's deck and get in the pool. Um, that's a safety issue to Sonny's point earlier. That's what we are trying to preclude as we apply this across the entire city um, to everybody that has a pool and a deck that's attached to it. This is a very consistently applied ordinance every plan that comes into us um, with this kind of a situation we provide them the same information regarding the setbacks and almost all of them complete and compile comply with that information um, that kind of fills in a little bit of the context um, piece of this but i i also want to add in just some some regional things too that most, almost all of the adjacent communities to us and across the country have this same kind of setback for a pool and a deck. Um, Lockport's, ours at six feet is actually the smallest of any of our adjoining neighbors. Um, 
Lamont is at seven and a half. Romeoville requires 10. Homer Glen requires 10 from all lot lines in one area, but they also don't even let you get it closer than halfway of your rear, lot, rear yard setback um, to the principal building. So theirs could be upwards of 20 to 30 feet um, there. And so this is an extremely consistently applied ordinance because of the safety conditions that exist when you have a pool. Um, from a findings of, well, let me go one other, th the, other, the other ordinance or the variance that they are requesting is the uh, reduction from five feet to three feet on the upper level deck. The image on the right shows how the patio doors um, relate to the edge of the building. The, the face on the right side of that right image is the south side of the house. The face that you're looking at with the patio doors is the west face of the house. And the newly constructed deck is there in the foreground. As you can see, it's as close to the patio doors, patio doors as it can be. Um, that is where, you know, as, you'll, as we'll go through my findings of fact, that's where there probably is a hardship that exists um, and not a safety issue. Um, the challenge with the upper deck comes is when it juts out to the south, which you can see in the left image where the upper deck angles back towards the, the neighbor's deck and then hugs the property line all the way down to the lower deck um, and inclusive of the lower deck. So just to go through the um, findings of fact, um, these are listed under section 156, 165 of the zoning code. Um, the Plan and Zoning Commission should not vary the regulations of the zoning code unless it makes findings of fact based upon the evidence presented. The following are our, our findings of fact for your information. If you choose to uh, select a different motion than what is uh, recommended by staff, we would need to identify findings of fact that would validate that so that we have that as part of the record. Um, there are eight of them total, I believe. And so I'll just run through those so that they're read into the record. Um, item A is the property in question cannot yield a reasonable return if permitted to be used only under the conditions allowed by the regulations of the district in which it is located. Um, our response to that is the property could yield a reasonable return if permitted to be used only under the regulations allowed in the RO district. The pool is correctly sited greater than six feet from the property line, which contributed to its approval in 2019 with an older fence in place around the yard. When the applicant added the deck and new fencing without building, building department review, it caused the violation. Reconfiguring the deck or shifting the pool would allow the setback to be maintained. We recognize that this would require the applicant to remove portions of the deck already constructed, which is unfortunate. However, had they reviewed their plans with the department prior to construction, we could have worked with them to avoid the violation and the safety hazard. Item B, the proposed variation will not merely serve as a convenience to the applicant, but will alleviate some de demonstrable and unusual hardship that will result if the strict letter of the regulations were carried out, which are not generally applicable to property within the same district. No demonstrable and unusual hardship has been identified by the applicant should he have to comply with the regulations regarding the pool and attached deck. The applicant constructed the deck knowing that he needed a setback variance, but constructed it where he wanted for his convenience and to maximize the size of their yard. Regarding the five foot setback on the upper level deck, there is a reasonable hardship given the location of the patio doors into the house. Their location requires the easternmost portion of the deck to be within the setback. However, the stairs connecting the lower deck do not share the same hardship and are actually unnecessarily located closer to the property line than the upper deck. The alleged hardship has not been directly created by any person presently having a proprietary interest in the premises. The alleged hardship for the pool deck was created by the owners of the property who, without first obtaining a permit for the pool deck, constructed the deck where it is currently located to accomplish the desired effect to maximize the size of the yard. Item D, the proposed variation will not, material, will not be materially detrimental to the public welfare or injurious to other property or improvements in the neighborhood. <clears throat> flip the screen or you're on oh, D. Yep, I certainly will. Thank you. The proposed variations will not be material de materially detrimental to the public as the proposal maintains the residential character of the area. We recognize that one of the statements the, 
the applicant will bring forward to prove their right to place the deck wherever they would like is that the neighbors to the south have a deck close to the property line and they should be able to as well. We understand that the southern neighbor constructed a deck in the similar location to the applicant. However, based on our permit records, it's over 20 years old. It is not directly on the property line, nor is there a pool associated with it. And it is also not the subject of this case or the violations. Given its age, it may need to be replaced soon. And if so, would not be allowed to remain in its current location. Um, there is also a concern um, that Sonny actually brought up late today um, regarding just public welfare and how that relates to the safety hazard created by the pool um, and the relationship of that deck within the setback for that safety hazard. Item E, the proposed variation will not impair an adequate supply of light and air to adjacent property, substantially increase congestion in the public streets, increase the danger of fire or endanger the public safety. The proposal should not impair light and air to adjacent properties, primarily because the neighbor is to the south, open to the sun. However, it does put a new fence directly adjacent to the neighbor's lower deck, eliminating their view to the north. The improvement will not increase congestion, the danger of fire or public safety for people in the adjacent streets or sidewalks. Brian actually mentioned today that he has a recent case where a fence caught on fire here in town, um, which caused a fire on the home. Um, in his opinion, that is an issue with this fence and where it is located with the deck um, included into it. Uh, if that would be a fire issue, which is a part of that evaluation metric. Item F, the proposed variation will not alter the essential character of the locality. The essential character of the locality should not be altered. There are other decks in the area and its, and its location in the back and side yard of the home is consistent with other adjacent properties. The proposed variation is in harmony with the spirit and intent of this chapter. The variations related to the pool deck are not in harmony, harmony with the spirit and intent of the zoning ordinance as no justifiable hardship has been identified for the setback variations. The variation related to the upper deck setback is in harmony with the intent as it stays away from the adjacent property as far as possible within the context of the patio doors. Based on the standards by which a variance or variances are evaluated, the applicant has not demonstrated factors A, B, C, and G in staff's opinion for the variance request related to the pool deck, and therefore staff cannot recommend approval to re reduce the required setback from six feet to zero feet. Of note to the commission is that any variance granted where no, just, no written justifiable hardship is found and the hardship is caused by the applicant sets a precedent in the community and limits our ability to enforce what we believe to be a resident safety issue around pools. Similar to other community zoning regulations, the city's zoning code authorizes vari variations only in those specific instances in which the standards set out in the findings of fact are met. Related to the upper setback reduction from five feet to three feet, it is our finding that the applicant has a justifiable hardship for the variance request and staff would recommend approval for, the, for a portion of the upper deck. Um, we would also request that the plan, and commission, plan and zoning commission note as a part of the motion <clears throat> that the applicant needs to flip the fence and follow the code that requires the good side of the fence to face outward as a part of any reconstruction if a denial of the variance request occurs. The fence facing requirement is consistently applied and expected throughout the city. Our recommended motions to you are found on the screen. There is a slight variation from what is in your uh, written packet. Um, this was some technical language that Sonny wanted to make sure that we included. So I'll read it off of the screen so that everybody has it. Um, our recommended motions are item one, a motion to adopt the findings of fact outlined in staff's memo and as presented at the hearing that the applicant has not met the standards outlined in section 156, 165, and for the reasons stated in the record, deny the variance request for a deck attached to the swimming pool to be located within six feet of the property line. Our recommended motion for item number two is a motion to adopt the findings of fact outlined in staff memo and as presented at the hearing that the applicant has met the standards outlined in section 156, 165 and for those reasons grant the variance request for the upper deck setback reduction from five feet to three feet for a distance of six feet from the west face of the house with a condition that the applicant flip the fence and following city code that requires the good side of the fence to face outward. That concludes our staff report. 
welcome any questions. The applicant, Ed and Sandy, are here to answer any questions um, that you might have of them or to add any information that you would also like to add. And like I said before, Brian Polis is here as well, our building inspector who has right. dealt with the applicant too. What would you like to tell us? I'd really like to just show you one picture because um, I think it would help. I do have a zip drive. If I don't know if I can get this. In here. Uh, let's see. Maybe. Oh, I can get it. Yeah. Let me. Uh, the deck is. Um, it's not finished yet. We stopped working on the fence when. Uh oh. I I don't know if it's going to come up. Software. I do have a, I do have a um, snapshot of it, but we we're trying to make it safe. It's it's not finished yet. So what we were the picture that you saw didn't okay. have the. Can we pass these around? Yeah. yeah. There you go. I'm sure. sorry, the picture's not working, but we stopped working on the fen or on the deck as soon as the stop order was put on the door. <laughs> The only thing that we did since they came over, you know, he said to put up um, safety railings and everything. We didn't put up temporary. I wasn't involved in the conversation, but we put up railings and that was it. Ra railings and fence, because we have three children. Our neighbors have children. We didn't, and they come over and play. We didn't want anybody getting hurt. That's the only thing that we did since they came over. So what, and so the significance are these pictures what, what that's what it looks like now okay and that i just it's going to be closed off yeah we brought up, uh, lance brought up the point that they can access the deck from their deck okay but we're planning on it's closed off that's the main reason why we put that fence along the whole south property line so this was existing with the this is right lattice. now that's right. And this, well, what it, get this it's picture? just a little thing that it? I did on the computer to show. Yeah. yeah, it's photoshopped. Okay. I just wanted to show that we're trying to make it safe. We're trying to make it safe. Do you have a building permit for this now? No, I didn't. No. Do you have one now? I no, we waiting, don't. We've we're been working for on the variance this. to see. We can't get a building permit until the plan is approved. There is no plan because. We don't have we have to apply for the variance so we've been you going back and have forth. you submitted plans for approval yes twice twice okay and now we're here okay and now we're here is there anyone from the public to wish to speak on this matter please come up to the podium sir state your name Address for record, and we'll swear you in. Uh, my name is Chris Flood. I'm at 713 South Jefferson. Which I'm is to the south of the or south. Okay. Uh, the gray deck, if you saw in the photos. Um, I, I could honestly, ask we need the, to swear you in. Yeah. <clears throat> what? We need to swear you in. Okay. Do you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I swear. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I don't have a problem with the deck. Um, I mean, it seems to be secure, safe. My deck is secure and safe as well, um, so it's locked. Uh, I, I know that they're going to finish the improvements on, on it as well to, to make it safe for our children. Um, as far as fire code, I saw that. I mean, it's a wood deck. It's a wood fence all the way around my property. There's a wood fence all around his property. There's a wood fence, you know, next door. So it, it, it fits into that neighborhood. You know, there's nothing. You, there's no changing of that. I would feel that it would be almost more of a safety issue if there became a, a gap because it's on a hill and then kids could fall down in between. So as of right now, that area is closed and it's secured. <clears throat> okay. Okay, thank you. I mean, one thing we have here is the, house, the foundation of the house is one foot onto the neighbor's property. So to bring the deck and stuff into conformance, it had to, we've got a one foot gap here because of that. And that's recorded on the plat by the title company. So, questions, comments? Thank you, Chris. 
The only, uh, my only question is, once this various is, is if it's passed, right, and they're allowed, you know, to keep this, which I, again I don't have an issue with. Is would there, as long as there's no issue, once it's passed, there's no issue in, in if, if he sells his property, if I sell my property, right? Would that be correct? If this is passed tonight, you're asking for legal advice, and we don't give it. You don't have that. Information. <laughs> okay. I, I, well, that's if if fine. the variance is is granted, and that's one of the problems with with granting a variance is that this neighbor at this time may not have any objections to being close to the property line, zero um, property line, but you have adjacent new owners with younger kids and the whole purpose of having the setback no longer serves its purpose when the variance is granted. So it's, it stays there. I understand so, that. Uh, I mean, but yeah, I'm just as, uh, responding to your question and that's the whole purpose of it. So it does stay with the uh, property, but if there's any expansion or any relocation or anything in which um, the original variance that's granted is no longer valid, then they would have to come back into compliance. The whole purpose of a zoning code is to have uniformity and compliance. Variance is an exception to that. And the you know uniformity in the zoning code is to get all the property owners into compliance at one set time. That's that's the actual ultimate goal, and the variance is an exception to that. Thank you, Sunny. I just want to say one thing: uh, the way our houses are in downtown Lockport. I mean, I think our houses were around before property lines. I feel like our houses were actually connected at one point. Yes. The way that it said, I don't know if you're familiar with the area, but it's not like a new subdivision. Right. It's our house was, you know, on his property. When we bought the house 20 years ago at the closing, they had to hurry up and get a variance for that, for our property being on the other person's property. Well, it, it wasn't a variance. All the, the title company over insured against it. So yeah. The city didn't That's have anything to do with it. And, and I just wanted to add, and and just to agree with you, you know, um, I understand, but that property is strange. It is kind of like a, like a cliff, you know? <laughs> uh, I feel like the way the fence is, is, is now, it actually makes it safer. I mean, like, if it, like Sandy was saying, if, if it was in, a, in a, a normal subdivision where flat land, and I can understand the variance what you guys are trying to en enforce here, but this particular property, because it's kind of like a cliff and there, the pool is there, and it, it is kind of strange. I feel it's, it's safer now with the, those fences there the way they are. Well, we're talking about the deck. Yes. 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 The fence is a separate issue. Well, that's what I mean. I mean right. the deck, the deck. If, the way it, the if way it does it's get, or, or yeah, if it does get passed and we're able to complete that, blocking that off. Basically, what it is is there's a stockade six foot fence adjoined to the decks together, not together, but separated. But it keeps anything from getting over into our yard from their deck or our deck. Right. It basically blocks the whole southern lot line. So that's why when I built constructed it I had put it that close so I could put a fence along the southern line and keep anything from coming in or out you know that's all okay questions comments anyone else from the public wish to speak if, if I could ask Lance a question um, regarding if the applicant um, submitted an application prior to building the deck, would there have been a reasonable measure to uh, build the deck, the pool deck, in a way it would have come into compliance or been in compliance with the city code? I think had the, had the applicant submitted plans and drawings, we would have probably worked with them to try and identify, and I think Ed and I, we talked about that when we were out on site together. Um, to try and identify a way or a method that you know we could stay in compliance with the with the zoning code and provide the life safety protections that the that we believe are important as a part of the zoning code. Um, have we done a detailed study to identify that specific method? No, we have not. Um, we really wanted to wait until this variance 
you know, was heard and decided on before we spent too much time uh, really working with Ed. And I think he would agree that he wouldn't want to spend a bunch of time working on it until you per- figured this piece of it out too. Um, so no, we have not done a detailed study. Um, just eyeballing it, standing out there, I think there's probably a likely solution for it. Um, the easiest solution is to move the pool and keep the deck and the same size, but just shift it six feet away. Would you put that back up on the screen, Lance? Yeah. Picture the. That? Yes. So at the right hand side with his handrail, that's the area that should come down. Correct. All the way to the stairway and the staircase should go the other way. Correct. To conform to the code. Okay. This lattice under the, behind the stair treads, what is there? And that's south. I think that's an open area underneath your deck, right? Used to be a greenhouse there. A greenhouse? Mm-hmm. Really? I always wondered what our houses were. <laughs> there was a greenhouse. You there. know, there were tunnels in our foundation. Where did those? T- what were those used for? No. <laughs> it's a very interesting property. Greenhouse. Okay. Um, n- no one else from public wishes to speak. Or we'll accept a motion to close the public hearing. So move. Move by Perfino, second by Likens. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, commissioners, what's your thoughts? We'll start with Mr. Shepard. You know, I wish, uh, like Lance said, if it would have been taken care of ahead of time and worked something out, I, I would really love to see something where it was worked out and um, all the permits were gotten ahead of time, first thing. Mm-hmm. I think that would have saved a lot of headache here. Okay, Scott, anything? I, I agree with, with Ken, and it's a matter of um, liability protection. I know that everybody has good intentions here, um, but many times those good intentions won't hold up in court, especially if something tragic happens. And so um, I think this is a matter of protecting not just the city, but you, Mr. Riley. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, how far is the pool from the property line? Eight feet. So, with a six foot setback, you could only put a two foot walkway around the pool, huh? So, wouldn't that have made you think about wrapping the deck around the other side of the pool? And maybe making the stairs go parallel to the house and swing them over on the other side of the pool? Yes, from but. From the upper deck? then it wouldn't really block the... Was, was there a hardship for that? To put the stairs going the other way from the upper deck to where the lower uh, deck We were just trying going? to line up with the neighbor's deck so we could secure and make sure that it was blocked off. So I don't know. We thought it was safer that way. And that's and we, we would use less of our, our yard having... The deck over on that side instead of the, the other side. So you're probably a union carpenter, I would imagine. So I would imagine that for a living you do deck projects, and I would think for every deck project you do for someone else, you pull a permit. So I'm really confused on why you wouldn't have done that for this and given the city an opportunity to help out here. So um, you know we have to follow rules just like you do. And the city attorney and Lance pretty much pointed out the reasons why uh, the lower deck is not going to be able to uh, have a variance. So the upper deck is fine. It's three feet away. You can't go any clo- any further because you'd, you'd cut off access to the upper um, sliding door window. That's up there, right? And there's sliding glass door up there? Yes. Okay. So, so 
I support the upper deck three foot, but the lower the lower part they got to have the they got to have the distance from the neighbor's yard. But so the next question is okay. Is there a way that the city can work with him to try to mitigate the cost of rearranging his deck? That's something else that Lance is going to have to work with him on. Because, um, I mean, it's a beautiful deck. And, you know, having to rip out the whole thing, hopefully there's another way around that. But so as far as the fence goes, flipping the fence is fine and making sure it's on the property line is fine. And... The distance, you had said that you, the bottom of the uh, fence is even with the top of the deck, and that's in case somebody jumps over the fence, they don't fall down into a ravine before they get to the deck, and that makes sense to me, but it's, it's the rules that's the, that's the issue here. And I don't know what else to say. Okay. I, I support the upper deck variance. I don't support the lower deck variance. Okay. Bill? I concur with staff's recommendations on both motions. The hardship being claimed here is really self-inflicted by the applicant. Uh, we grant hardships, uh, variances for other reasons, but I, I just don't see a bona fide hardship here at all. Thank you. Okay. Janine? No, I, I have nothing really to add. I also agree with the staff's recommendation. I have really nothing else to add to the comments already made, and I also agree with staff's recommendation. Okay, thank you. I wish there was an easier way here, but the safety of everyone involved, whether it's your children, the neighbor's children, or a kid from the neighborhood, it's just a problem with the deck and the pool. So I cannot support this deck. I mean, it has to be removed the way I see it and moved the stairs. The one upstairs, I support that. But so, so okay. Okay. So do we have a motion? Does it have to be a two part motion? Two yes. motions. Separate there will be motions. two separate yes. motions. Um, the motion recommended by staff is that um, a motion be made to adopt the findings of fact as outlined in the uh, staff memo and as presented at the hearing that the applicant has failed to meet the standards outlined in section 156.165 E1 of the zoning code and for the reasons stated in the record by the commissioners, deny the variance request for a deck attached to the swimming pool to be located within six feet of the property line. So moved. Moved by Porfinio. Second. Second by Likens. Any questions or comments before we vote? Roll call vote, please. That there was a Wait. motion to deny the variance, right? Correct. Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, Shepard. Yes. Likens. Yes. Porfilio. Yes. Oxley. Yes. Maloney. Yes. Pin is absent. And Wheeler. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Second motion. The second motion for this case is case lead. number 2020-001-VAR would be a motion to adopt the finding of fact outlined in the staff's memo and as presented at the hearing that the applicant has met the standards outlined in section 156.165 E1 and for those reasons grant the variance request for the upper deck setback reduction from 5 feet to 3 feet for a distance of 6 feet from the west face of the house with the condition that the applicant flip the fence and follow the city code that requires the good side of the fence to face outward. So moved. Moved by Porfinio. Second. Second by Likens. Any questions, comments, clarifications? Roll call vote, please. You got it. Uh, Shepard. Yes. Likens. Yes. Porfilio. Yes. Oxley. Yes. Maloney. Yes. Pin. I'm oh, sorry, he's absent. And Wheeler. Yes. <laughs> Motion passes. And just as additional um, note for the record, the decision of the commission on this application, including the two motions for the variance, one for denial the other for granting is a final administrative de decision so it does not go before the city council and is subject to review by the court of law in the manner prescribed by app applicable statute thank you sonny okay next case it's a 1302 porter place variance to reduce required rear yard setback Thank you, Chairman. 
<laughs> Are you able to hear me okay? Pardon me? Are you able yeah. to hear me okay? I would recommend you could take the mask off when you're speaking. Motion there is an exception to the DCO guidelines that when you are speaking the public, you can take off the face mask. Okay. We Thank want you. a motion to open the public hearing? Yes, a motion to op open the public hearing. Thank you. Second. Motion by Wheeler, second by Likens. All in favor, second five, saying aye. 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 Okay, before we start, anyone here to testify in this would be sworn in. Kimberly, Mr. Warner, do you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, to help you God? I do. Yes. Raise your right hand. Thank you. Okay. Kimberly, you're on. Thank you, Chairman. The next case before you this evening is a variance request. Case 2020-002, VAR and it takes place at 1202 Porter Place. A variance requires public hearing. Required notification of the public hearing has been completed. The applicant, Mr. Werner, is seeking approval from the Plan and Zoning Commission for a variance that will allow the construction of an approximate 345 square foot Four Seasons room addition to be located at the rear of the home. The proposed addition will encroach the required uh, rear setback the applicant is seeking variance to reduce the required rear setback from 30 feet to 12 feet on the east side. We'll display the property for you. Here's an aerial display, and here is the, the plat of survey for you. The lot itself is generally in compliance with the bulk requirements. However, the lot is pie-shaped, as it is located at the bulb of a cul-de-sac. Because of this, the lot depth is reduced when compared to surrounding properties. This can be seen on the Plata survey. The existing dwelling is a tri-level home and is currently encroaching the rear setback at 27.6 feet from the rear property boundary. Variance requests are subject to standards listed under section 156.165 of the zoning code. The Plan and Zoning Commission should not vary regulations of the zoning code unless it makes findings of fact based on the evidence presented that a the property in question cannot yield a reasonable return if permitted to be used only under the conditions allowed by the regulations of the district in which it is located staff finds that the property could yield a reasonable return if permitted to be used only under the regulations allowed in the r1 district b the proposed variation will not merely serve as a convenience to the applicant, but will alleviate some demonstrable and unusual hardship that will result if the strict letter of regulations were carried out, which are not generally applicable to property within the same district. Although the v proposed variation will serve as a convenience, a unique circumstance has been identified by staff. Due to the pie-shaped lot configuration, the home is currently encroaching the rear setback. The city zoning ordinance allows for a 20-foot front yard setback of lots that are located within a cul-de-sac bulb. However, in this case, the home is set back 30 feet, um, which meets the established front yard setback along Porter Place, limiting the available lot area within the rear yard. C, the alleged hardship has been directly created by any person presently having a propriety interest in the premises. Uh, the applicant did not create this hardship. Um, <clears throat> e, the proposed variation will not impair an adequate supply of light and air to adjacent property, substantially increase congestion in public streets, increase the danger of fire, or endanger the public safety. The proposal should not impair light and air to adjacent properties, increase congestion on streets, or endanger public safety. There are no residences located um, east of the property. As you could see on the, um, the aerial there, the property is located on open space because the Lockport Township High School um, is located to the rear of Mr. Werner. Um, <clears throat> F, the proposed variation will not alter the essential character of the locality, and the character will not be altered. The proposed building addition will not be located within public view. And G, 
The proposed variation is in harmony with the spirit and intent of this chapter. The variation is in harmony with the spirit and intent of the zoning ordinance as a justifiable hardship and has been identified for the rear setback uh, variation. I do also have slides here um, for you that are displayed on your monitor that show the location of the, um, the Four Seasons room um, behind the, the, the dwelling. One of the things that staff considered was that potentially the sunroom could meet the setbacks on the side yard. However, that um, was not functional as it appears that the utilities and whatnot are located in the side yard. Um, additionally, there would be, there could be a potential impact um, if located in the side yard. It just functionally from um, all the way around, it's more adequate and reasonable to be located within uh, the rear yard. <clears throat> Here are photos of the rear yard displayed on your monitor. Here's the, the side yard. Um, based on the standards by which a variance is evaluated, the applicant has demonstrated a unique circumstance and justifiable hardship for the variance request. Should the Plan and Zoning Commission find the request acceptable, then the following motion is recommended. A motion to adopt the findings of facts is presented to recommend the approval of the variance for rear setback from 30 feet to 12 feet within the R1 single family residential district to allow a building addition. This concludes staff's analysis, and the applicant is present this evening to answer questions. Thank you, Kimberly. Mr. Werner, welcome. All I, all I can say is that uh, I'm talking to the neighbors, they sort of agree with what we're trying to do. And uh, the lot does have more. Uh, we have an easement, a 10 foot easement off the east property line as well. Okay. But, uh, Basically, the, the room is going to be a glass enclosure. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much it. Okay, looks very nice. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this matter? Commissioners, any questions for the applicant, staff? Um, as was the case with the last uh, gentleman that was in front of us, he couldn't prove that there was hardship. So with this building, Hardship is what? The side yard well, the hardship is that. I just wanted to ask. Was there ever any thoughts on putting it in the side yard instead of the back? Was there no door access or something? Is that why it went in the back? Utility easements. No, like we've looked at that several other times in the, in the past. Uh, we do have utilities coming in from the south, both electric, cable, and then. Yes, the architect's plan something. Yeah. And <laughs> we do on the north side. That's all you had to say. I didn't see them on here. They didn't show up, so. Well, that's okay. That was the hardship. That's fine. I'm good with it. But also, one other thing is that there's a, a, a drainage swale around the house to protect it from water from the runoff from the golf course. Utilities. That's good enough for me. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Motion to close public hearing. So moved. Moved by Perfino, second by Lycan. So all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay, what's your pleasure here? We're going to put the motion back up on the screen, Kimberly. This is a motion to adopt findings of facts as presented by staff to recommend the approval of variance from rear yard setback from 30 feet to 12 within the R1 single family resident district to allow a building addition. Okay, so moved. Moved by Porfino, second by Likens. Questions, comments? We'll call vote, please. You got it. Uh, Shepard? Yes. Likens? Yes. Porfilio? Yes. Oxley? Yes. Maloney? Yes. Pin is absent. And Wheeler? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much, Mr. Yep. Werner. Thank you, and sir. And again, um, as the prior application, this is a final determination by the commission. It does not go before the city council. And um, I don't believe you will appeal the decision since you're getting the variance. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Make sure you get a building permit. Me? Make sure you get a building permit. <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> what's, what's the next step to get the, the permit from you? The permit. Department. Actually, you can see Julie back there. She'll walk you right through. Find my text. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Okay. Um, do, 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 do. I'm looking for the text amendments, Lance. Yes. I don't. Um, yeah, is case number 20-2020-001TA. Um, this is a, also a public hearing. I, I did not um, give the chair a script for the public hearing, but um, obviously I, I would request a motion to open up the public hearing prior to Lance giving the details and then close the public hearing for any deliberation. Okay, thank you. Motion to open the public hearing. Motion by Profino, second by Lykins. So All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Lance, you're already sworn in, so we can't do All right. any more of that. Thank you. So we are looking at five different um, adjustments to the zoning code uh, for tonight's review. Um, they relate to five different things. We want to look at one specific item on the bulk requirements for accessory structures. Um, we want to look at the requirements related to micro pantries and micro libraries. Um, we need to adjust a couple minor requirements for cargo containers. Um, there was some duplication that occurred when the development code got updated and, and finished a couple years ago with what was in the zoning code before. <clears throat> and then a, one change to the administrative variance uh, parameters um, in which we we're able to grant variations administratively. So just to go and kind of go through some of this in, in a little bit more detail to give you the background on the accessory structure uh, bulk requirement item, the city's code currently requires a maximum height of 15 feet for detached garages and carports. Um, it doesn't allow basically the garage to reflect the roof line of the principal residence. And so anytime you have a roof line that's greater than even six, 612, um, you're going to run into an issue where you can't do it. So it almost has to be a 312 roof to meet 15 feet, which um, when we were reading through it, we had a couple applicants come through requesting why it had to be 15 feet tall. And you know, we felt that that was something that we needed to adjust more immediate than once we get into the zoning code or overhaul later this year. In the lands, exactly, a 24-foot garage could only have a five and a half, 12 pitch. Right, exactly. It, it, <laughs> and so, you know, from an aesthetic standpoint, what, what was frustrating about that is a lot of our downtown homes have steeper gables and a lot of the, the newer ones do as well. And so when you have a, a regulation that doesn't even allow it to match the main house um, when it's detached, um, that becomes an architectural and aesthetic issue that we wanted to try and see if we could resolve uh, by making this this modification. Um, so the recommended amendment um, that's provided in your staff report provides the applicant uh, flexibility to better reflect the character of the home, both in the roof line as well as the detailing, while still restricting the height to lower than the principal home on the property. Which makes perfect sense now has there been any talk about increasing the size of an accessory structure so we we looked into that and our code currently allows for 660 square feet of a garage mm -hmm. which you know is big enough to accommodate a three-car garage you know because I've had that I've had that question before as well and so we looked into that a little bit to try and identify you know if there was something that was restraining somebody from building a three-car garage and we didn't see in the code where you know you wouldn't be allowed to build <coughs> excuse me larger than a uh, or larger than a two-car garage right and that took place I can tell you when it took place we had a, a resident that was purchasing duplexes and building four and six car garages yeah, right. and renting the garages and then, he, and then when they changed it, he built two garages instead of one. Right. <laughs> yeah. That changed also, but that's how it, yeah. Didn't so, say they couldn't build two. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> well, that's where that stands, but it's a good question because it has come up. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to the accessory structure, specifically to micro pantries and micro library requirements, um, we've gotten a number of requests on the past few years, as well as specific to during this pandemic period, where um, 
a couple churches have asked as well as residents have asked whether or not they could put a micro pantry out on their property for people to be able to access much like the one that's across the street over here sure. and the one over by the credit union um, there's one over by sizzles as well um, so we've gotten a couple other requests for that what we don't want to have happen is we don't want a micro pantry or micro library 10 feet apart from each other scattered throughout the city so this allows us to provide a regularly spaced micro pantry or micro library around the community so that it is, it is walkable from most components of the city um, when people want to put one up. Um, we also had no real rules for what it should look like, how it should be built. We don't have a building permit application for it. So if it falls over on somebody, then there's no, you know, there, there were just a number of issues. So we've worked with, Brian is, is not here anymore, but we worked with Brian to come up with a permit application to build one of these that allows for us to do an inspection on the, on the footings and the foundation for it, for the posts. It gives some general height and mass uh, language in here. We do have a sample construction drawing in the permit just to give somebody a sense for what it could look like. They can obviously make adaptations when they submit. But that's the, in essence, that's kind of the goal of creating this. Um, we've actually held a couple of people off until we can get this through so that we have something to regulate it with um, before it just kind of scatters across the community. Um, related to cargo containers, um, one of the interesting thing that's happening that's happening with cargo containers these days is they are being used for far more than just carrying cargo anymore. Um, restaurants are being used or created out of them. Homes are actually being created out of them. Incubator spaces are being done with them. Um, they're just they're just being used in a whole variety of different ways right now. Um, this modification in the ordinance isn't something where we're looking to make a blanket application. We want to make sure that we can s control to a degree um, how these look and, and things like that. So they are restricted to specifically to public property. So like a public plaza space or something like that where, you know, if we want to do some incubator spaces, some people have heard of the mayor's um, uh, Maker Park idea, you know, something like that may be um, appropriate for this kind of a, an application. Um, we actually do have a uh, company called Second City Greens who is um, having their container actually uh, constructed uh, right now. Uh, they are a company that actually grows all of your lettuce greens, every other kind of green that people use inside a cargo container. It's ultraviolet light, it uses about five gallons of water a week. Um, it produces enough uh, food on a weekly or bi-weekly basis to serve multiple restaurants throughout the community. They're interested in doing community supported agriculture where people buy a subscription, they get a, a full box of whatever greens or something like that is harvested during that week. Um, so it's a really exciting opportunity for the city, but it prompted us to think about how this ordinance, because previously this was viewing it from the lens of stuff you see on 55 where the cargo containers are, are loaded up five high and they're stacked until a truck comes and gets them to go move goods. These are actually being retrofitted to produce something or house a business or something like that inside of them on a very temporary. Uh, we have a company right on New Avenue that makes the Correct. fire training out of Correct. the cargo containers, fire yes. training. Um, Lance, I believe we have an ordinance prohibiting cargo containers. We have an ordinance that allows them for certain conditions. So that's what's in the staff report is the text that text that is currently in the ordinance for cargo containers. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't allow them to be certain amount high. We only allow them to be in certain districts. We don't allow them to be used for storage for you know X amount of days on end, things like that. Right. What this is doing is is creating a, a mechanism for us to be able to create these small incubator spaces for businesses, little small retail maker shops and things like that. These aren't habitable spaces by any stretch of the imagination, but they could be like a small little unit that somebody could make jewelry out of during the day um, because they 
don't have enough money to rent out a, a business downtown or somewhere else. So we have edited the language, and you can see some of the language that we um, added to it on page five uh, and I believe six um, as well has most of the language. And like I said before, it's specific to um, property that is owned by the city. Um, and, and again, that's so that we can manage what they look like so that it doesn't become something that's generally applicable across all properties in the city. We didn't want that to be the case, but we do want to be able to manage it for something that we would have on city-owned property where it's an appropriate location for something like this. The, and we can, we can continue to ask questions after I go through these, so I'm not cutting you off. Um, the development code and zoning code duplication. Uh, the development code was rewritten in 2018, and I think, if memory serves me right, they were, it was actually bifurcated out of the zoning code and created as its own separate manual. When that occurred, there were two items, specifically residential driveway width and the structural number for slope of the driveway, um, where the standard details were put into the development code and, and created for that but the text still resided in the zoning code. I think that's so the, Lance, sorry to interrupt. It was a development manual that was in conflict with the zoning code? Is that, for some reason, I had that It's the details that are in the development code. Oh, it was in the de development, for some reason, the I manual. thought it was the, was the development manual. Okay. There was yeah. So um, this is just to simply clear that up so that what we want every, every developer to do is to reference the standard details so that they don't get tripped up by something that's a text thing in the zoning code that has nothing that's so far well, removed from the details. Well, and, and, and this brings, because I have this issue a few times here, um, on driveway aprons, we, a lot of them are from A to B from the sidewalk to the curb with a flare on them, a two foot flare. But now what's happening on the, on the re redo end of it, they're enforcing the new development code. I think we need a separation on the new development code and a drive and existing, like a like a subdivision comes in, they need the three five flare, but an existing to do the same. I mean, uh, we just had one in Calvin Grove last week. You want to move the tree? Where you want? Where are you going with the tree then? And we've had it in uh, subdivision what east of uh, Maple Hill, where they're all A to Bs, and the new code says. It's got a flare three foot on each side. Well, you've got a mailbox here and a tree that the city made the homeowner plant. You want to tear it all out. So we need to have a separation of that and a new thought of this is existing, this is the new development code. Because when you're replacing a driveway, it's not new development. Right. So I don't know if you have any comments on that. I mean, that's, that's kind of separate from this right, specific Right, but on the same lines, as long as we're looking I, at these things. But I understand what you're We need to be looking at that. About. Because it, it creates a headache for the concrete guy yep. every time it happens. I don't know any concrete guys. I don't either. <laughs> I never met one. But <laughs> we're looking for one. <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm saying, Phil? You understand where I'm, we've had this conversation. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I mean, we've, we've worked with uh, concrete contractors, whoever they, they may be, on those instances of... Um, variances due to mailbox trees being in the way uh, but it's it'd be difficult to find a one-size-fits-all for old development new development um, especially when sometimes it the the items that are out of variance are not limited to just those wings so we're trying to get driveways that are that are matched up with the driveway on the other side of the sidewalk that's one of our big issues lately. So if they have a single lane driveway and we want them to have a single lane apron. So it'd be difficult. Um, I mean, I'd be willing to talk with you more on it on if we can figure out a way to work on the wings and still try and bring driveways up to code as they're getting redone. Um, but I think just a, you know, old development, new development would be very difficult without having further variances each time well, it happens. And that's my point. We need to define this and 
the simple point is Maple Hill, it's a new subdivision within 10 years. Okay, all the driveways in there from the sidewalk to the curb taper two foot up. That's it. So you want to, and with enforcing the new development code, it's supposed to go straight and then flare for five, three feet out each way. Now how do you, now you've got a mailbox in the way and a tree in the way and the parkway and all the neighbor's driveways are A to B's. That doesn't work. That's just a matter of common sense in our, our line. Forget the new development code because this is not new development, this is re remodel. That's what I'm trying to get across. Okay. We've had it in Maple Hill a couple times, we've had it in Calvin Grove, every time it comes up, you know, it's, here we go. Okay, so I think that, that that's a, a good conversation to Absolutely. continue and, yeah. and continue to discuss and see how we, how we handle that. Um, and then the last, last item tonight uh, for the text amendments is related to the administrative variance process or the parameters, I should say. Um, oftentimes in the RO district, what we find is that um, there are non-conforming uh, Lots, non-conforming homes, non-conforming decks, non -conform, you know, lots of non-conforming stuff from the base code requirements. So let's just say, if a lot, if a house can only cover 60% of the lot in the RO district, oftentimes we find that they already cover 65%. If somebody wants to put a, a small shed or something like that out there, they can't anymore. Um, and the small shed kicks it over the administrative variance um, percentage, which is 20% over those base requirements. So, you know, in that case, if they were already at 66% and they wanted to add one more percent to it, I wouldn't be able to grant that variance to them administratively. It's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, time is a big factor in a lot of these because a lot of them are fences, decks, you know, all the small stuff that somebody needs to finish in a month or so. If we require them to come through this process to get everything that's over an administrative variance on the base zoning allowances, you create a time lag. So with our first case tonight at 707, that process started at the end of March and we're here in the middle of July um, before we can actually get the case heard. If this was a situation where, if that was a situation where it was just simply something that had a hardship and was totally justifiable and I could have normally granted that administratively, it would have saved them $250 in their filing uh, for a $350 administrative as opposed to a $600 variance to plan and zoning commission. Um, and it would have saved them two to three months worth of time where they could have actually had it completed and finished. So what this text amendment is, is requesting is that the administrative variance is related to the existing condition as opposed to the base code bulk requirements. So and I'll just give you another example of that. Let's just say in the RO district, <clears throat> we require that there's a, whatever, a, a 10 foot setback on something, whatever it is, X. Um, I could grant administratively a variance for up to um, an additional two feet into the into the arc because that would be my 20% limit. Oftentimes, for anybody that does live in the RO district, knows that many of our detached garages, sheds, everything else are already three feet off of the property line, meaning that anything they do at all to the property they have to go all the way to the to the Plan and Zoning Commission to get their variance heard and approved, even though it, it could be completely benign and not impact anybody and there's a, there's a justifiable hardship and we could grant that and have it done and they can have the project finished before they, they ever even file for Plan and Zoning Commission. So that is the request specifically within this, is to give uh, me or whoever is in my position a little bit more flexibility and it really relates more to the RO district more than any of the other ones because most of the other ones were built to you know 1940s Euclidean zoning requirements 
post that period. Um, and so we just, we're just looking for a little bit of more flexibility over the existing situation as opposed to the um, base zoning requirements. I was going to pick porches. Huh? I was going to pick porches for an example. <laughs> That's a 30 foot setback. Yep. Right. So you would be allowed to go to 25 percent then? No, it would be 20 percent over whatever the existing condition is. 20 percent. Okay. So the current administrative variance is already 20 percent, but it relates to the zoning district's bulk requirements. Okay. Whereas what this is saying is. If you look at if you look at down, downtown in the RO district, I would probably say that 40% of the homes here don't meet the RO district bulk requirements. Oh, yeah. And so they're Not set that. up, yeah, they're already set up in a in a fashion where they have to they either choose not to do their improvement, which sometimes is unfortunate um, because of the cost and the time, or uh, they're forced to pay $600 and the three months that's involved in the time in order to have their variance heard. So this is just simply requesting a little bit more flexibility to relate to existing conditions as opposed to just straight up zoning requirements in the code. So so let's use a 30 foot setback. You're allowed under administrative to give 20 percent, which is six feet. Six feet, right. And if the house was, let's say, 28 feet off if the house was 28 feet and they wanted to put a porch on there this would allow me to not to reflect the 28 feet and not have to go back to the 30 feet to reflect sure. the variance piece that's actually a very good example because it's one that that has come up um, you know the house is is already beyond the front front yard setback okay. line but if we do a variance I have to currently for an administrator relate it to the base requirement at 30 feet and not actually reflect where the house actually is. And especially in this case, in an infill, like if the lot, the house over there is 22 feet right. from the front and this one's 15, right. you balance, the lot in the middle balances. So that changes that whole parameter. Any questions, comments? I think the easier we can make it for people to make improvements to the downtown, the older downtown residential districts is an asset to Lockport. Mm -hmm. We want people to I, invest in this area. I totally agree with that, Scott. And what Lance pointed out was that sometimes people go, you know what, I'm, I'm not messing with getting that and doing this. I got to get a variance. I got to do all this. It's a, it, forget it. And they just, mm -hmm. they don't do any improvement because of that. The, uh, the micro pantries and libraries, mm -hmm. you have an area restriction of 10 square feet. What about the depth? Well, that would include the, the depth. So it's total size of 10 square feet. For, for the engineer and the crew, I mean, we'll, 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 we'll review getting. how you calculate your feet. I'm getting, I'm getting at cubic feet, OK? <laughs> <laughs> cubic feet, how deep is it? I didn't mention cubic feet. How deep can it be? Feet. You don't have a restriction. <laughs> hey, right here. <laughs> listen to me. Like, Scott just drew it for you. It's done. <laughs> the drawing's done. Let me finish. Square feet, it's the front of it, 10 square feet. How deep can it be? Is there a restriction on that? I didn't see a depth. It's, Width it's, and height it's, is 10 it's, square feet. What's the depth? The 10, <laughs> the 10 square feet is supposed to be from plan view looking down. So you can do anything within two by five. Two by five, 3.33 3 3 by 3.33. 3 3. Yeah, that's, that's the front of it though, no, the depth. No, no, that's the plan, plan. You said it looks like a like a birdhouse. It does look like a birdhouse. I'm telling you. Yeah, it's, it's ten house. looking down. Okay. In plan, you can have up to ten square feet. In three the, by the, three, uh, two by five, one by. Okay, ten, what's the third three, dimension? Two. It's got three dimensions. Vertically? Yeah. It doesn't have a vertical. From, from plan view. You can't make it higher than five there feet is, here. Yeah, there is a height. Right here. Yeah, five there's feet. a height. It's five feet. Listen, Brent. If okay. you build one, and I won't build one. If you build one, you I'm just asking. Make sure you got all three. Variance. All three dimensions are on there. That's fine. I just, I just got to say, I think, I think it's great that we have an architect to explain square feet and an engineer <laughs> to explain utilities right. shown on plans. <laughs> it's getting better every day. <laughs> cubic feet. Square feet. Twenty-seven cubic feet. I didn't the see the third dimension yeah. in there. So be quiet. Yeah, you know, five feet. Five feet tall. Ten square. Yeah, ten square feet. Plan view. So it can actually sit on the ground too. If it was, so it doesn't have to be a pole underneath it. It can sit on the ground actually. 
I mean, the, the detail that we've pulled to try and standardize as much as we can with it is a pretty consistent, it meets within these requirements. Um, a lot of the people that we have asking have literally no clue what to build. They just want to put something out How there. How do I do it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh -huh. so this allows them to take a plan to a contractor, a carpenter, or whoever, and he can just simply build exactly what's in the what's in the plan. So, you know, kind of the goal is to somewhat standardize a lot of the look mm -hmm. across the city so that we don't end up with a mission. Good idea. Stuff and I, that's good. And I would imagine hydroponic uh, farming is for the stuff that's not allowed in our city, which is weed, right? No weed. He's talking about vegetables for restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's what you that's, can grow all kinds of stuff in there, you said. So well, just make sure it's not up that to one. the individual owner. <laughs> and again, that's one of the reasons why we want it on city property is so that we can manage mm -hmm. uh, things like that. And no squatters, there's no uh, people that can live in them. I think you have something that covered, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, Lance, can I ask you about those cargo containers? I, I haven't seen a lot around. Have you had a lot of requests about them, or where would this be at? Well, the the Second City Greens thing was really the, the piece that jump-started this conversation internally for us, um, because we, in our in the current ordinance, it doesn't really doesn't really reflect what they specifically want to do. It doesn't allow for an agricultural use inside a cargo container. But it has to be it, part of a farm. But it but it has to be part of a farm. And we also know, knowing that um, the mayor's Maker Park idea, whether it's on the Texaco site or the Sloan pad that the city bought a couple years ago, um, having something that could be located to a site that could be quickly um, transformed into something that somebody could work something out of on a temporary basis or an incubator basis was something that we thought would be a, a good low cost way to introduce businesses into the city, give them a foothold to be able to, to then hopefully expand and go into one, go into Janine's building. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only thing I noticed is like the use limitations um, under 3E, it says um, shall not be used for conducting business or selling merchandise, but then the exception Yeah, that's the exemption from the use of the limitation of cargo containers. Normally, you can't use it for, for retail, but then very specifically, if it's on the cargo containers are on a city-owned property used for facilitating innovative use, then it can be for retail startup business. So we're, you, we're just carving out an exception to the general restrictions on using cargo containers. I will make a note of that and make that change. Okay. You said there has to be city owned property, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're not going to see them pop up on personal property. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a current, um, that's how we want to start out so we have some control. Um, there are places like Austin, you know, Texas, some of these places where they've converted the cargo units into, they, and they actually stack them up. Mm -hmm. and make them into spaces and recreate them either like leave it as is with those retro you know um, some type of retail company lining or they they will repaint it or they will make it you know open up all three sides for some type of open you know seating bars seating so it, it's there's a very innovative use of using these cargo containers and not the way that we see them as just storage containers and what the hydroponic um, hydroponic farm will do is they're just going to drop those cargo containers at the Sloan pad and just connect with either you know utility and 
be able to use the water, but they don't really generate a lot of electricity or and they don't have a lot of excess waste. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yeah, I did for Lance. If a homeowner has to uh, build a ramp from the front door down to the sidewalk and the setback area to make the house wheelchair accessible for a resident, can you do that administratively or does that have to come here? Depends on what the distance and the, all the metrics are. Well, obviously it's, it's going to be well into the setback area, but I mean, I think in the past, to me, that's a legitimate hardship. And we've ran it for, for as long as they, they need that particular access. Yeah, I mean, that, I don't, I don't know if we can carve out exclusion for specific elements. Um, that could be granted administratively regardless yeah. of how far they go into setbacks. Um, but this at least gives us a little bit more to work with than yeah. we had before. Well, I mean, if Rama falls and breaks her hip and is suddenly in a wheelchair, they need a ramp in a big hurry. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anybody's going to mess with it or they don't even want to get involved with the ADA on it, let me tell you. No. <laughs> you don't even want to get involved in that mess. So just basically it's one of those, eh, just do it and have a nice day. Okay, that's the only concern I had. <laughs> it really is. It's... Any other questions? You have Any... to have slabs or something under the containers? You're going to require that? Foundation? More than likely, I mean, see any that? of the places that okay. we would, any well, of the I mean, places I, that... I just I didn't see it in there. It's probably in the development code then, right? You put it in there, the standards. In newer is there really? Yeah. <laughs> any of reference it. I would imagine that's part of it. I didn't see it in there. Any of the places that we would put them on public property, we would make sure that they have the appropriate support underneath it. Any other questions or comments? Motion to close the public hearing. So move. Second by Shepard. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Comments, questions? Motion. Uh, motion to approve the proposed amendments to Chapter 156 of the City's Code of Ordinances. We have a second by Mr. Likens. Roll call vote, please. Okay, Shepard. Yes. Likens. Yes. Porfilio. Yes. Oxley. Yes. Maloney. Yes. And is absent. And Wheeler. Yes. Motion passes. Any other questions or comments? Did everyone take the, I believe it's under human resources, sexual harassment? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, Everyone complete that? Forgot, that is not an excuse. <laughs> no? I, I took care of it right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When did Scott, the, this was emailed yeah. to us? Yeah, it was emailed out as a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we were weeks, yeah. planning on doing live presentation, but because with COVID-19, it's a um, training to prevent sexual harassment or harassment in the workplace. Any um, appointed officials, um, including the members of the city council, must take so it. Just watch a video and take a test? Yep. Or, take, uh, there's no test. You no just test. watch the video, certify you watched it. You watch it and press yes, and you're yep. done. And, and if you don't you know, take it and you don't certify that you took it, then you, they, they will publish your name yeah. um, pay for, for people. Page. <laughs> <laughs> Not concurrent with that. Yeah, that's Who true. sent that email? Was that the it was clerk? It was Brit I that. believe Brittany. Was, I sent it. You oh, sent, sent it? it? Okay, you sent I'll it. I'll look for it. Okay. Ignored your, you ignored your email. Typical. Uh, Typical. You're used to it, though. Okay, any other questions or comments? Motion to adjourn. So moved. By Porfirio, second by Shepard. Likens. All in favor, signify by Shepherd saying Shepard or Likens? Likens. Likens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. <laughs> Shaky.